everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, my talk, which I'll be talking about today, about the future of viral therapy. And so as a scientist and a professor, I've long been curious about how viruses cause disease and really just how they work. I'm sure all of you have experienced viral infections and how hard it is to get over those diseases. And when you think about it, as you run to the drugstore, you run to your doctor, you realize virus infections are hard to take care of and treat. Why? There are very few therapies available. And even the therapies that we do have, we're always, in these cases, afraid of resistance or the virus changing itself in that situation and therefore mutating and therefore having to have another type of treatment option. And a lot of the times there isn't treatment options. And so we have to resort to pretty much taking most of the time over-the-counter drugs to try and mask our symptoms, but really it's not necessarily getting rid of the infection. And so as I'm thinking about you know, this, this virus scenario, it's important that we start shifting our thoughts, shifting the way we think about virus therapy. Maybe instead of trying to have specific drugs against every virus, maybe there's possibilities to have drugs that are a little bit more universal. And maybe instead of targeting the virus itself, maybe we should shift our thoughts and consider, let's target the way the virus changes the cell it infects, which is known as a host cell. Uh, here is a, a picture which I'm going to show you. No? Okay. Uh, here is a photograph uh, which is showing you a picture of a non-infected cell to your left. Uh, and you can see that the green, the green proteins are pretty much the skeletal proteins of the cell that are stained. And to your right, you see an infected cell, which has its proteins, or the viral proteins, shown in red. And as illustrated by these two photographs, what you are seeing is that a virus can dramatically alter the architecture, or pretty much the structure of a cell. But these changes are not just physical. They can also cause disease, which I'm sure you know about. Uh, but they can also lead to alterations in the cell that can lead to changes such as cell metabolism or maybe immortality, uh, and therefore lead to some prospects for the future of antiviral therapy. So it's important as we think about viruses uh, that we consider what really are viruses. So when you look at all of these viruses on this screen, they have a couple of things in common. One, all viruses are non-living. Can you believe that? These viruses really that are infecting you and pretty much are taking over your body are not even alive. They're considered obligate intracellular parasites, which means they take over the host cell and they pretty much use that cell to make more of them. They don't divide pretty much or grow, but they rely on the cell and the machinery that the cell has in order to make more of themselves. They're composed of a couple of basic units, such as genetic information in the form of DNA or RNA. They have proteins, and they're made of fats called lipids. And in general, the protein encompasses a shell around the virus. And some viruses, like herpes viruses or influenza viruses or HIV, also has a fatty envelope, which encompasses it. As I mentioned before, uh, when you look at viruses and infections, uh, what you'll see is that pretty much these viruses have to take over the host cell. And when they do, they pretty much hijack that host and able to make new viruses in the process. Some viruses are even really sneaky. Not only do they infect cells, but they hide. They hide within the genetic information of that cell and therefore remain for the rest of your life. And because these viruses are pretty much like reservoir viruses, you may feel better after a while. But really, that virus is still there. And currently, there are no drug therapies available that can get rid of reservoir virus. And so as we look at the future of virus therapy, it's important that we consider you know, where virus therapy is going and how we can, cons how we can target that virus. And so I first got interested in viruses when I was considering studying how viruses cause cancer. I was in graduate school at the University of Washington. And I was interested in viruses that cause cancer because it's been shown that approximately 20% of cancers, one in five cancers, have a virus origin that caused that cancer. Uh, just as some examples, you might see that some viruses like Epstein-Barr virus, which causes mono, can also cause Burkitt's lymphoma. 
Some viruses, like human papilloma virus, cause cervical cancer, which I'm sure you've read in the news. Viruses such as hepatitis virus, which causes liver cancer. And the virus that was near and dear to my heart during my graduate school studies was Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, which causes Kaposi sarcoma. And so when I was studying these viruses and realizing you know, they're causing you know, cancer, I wanted to think about really what is cancer and how can a virus cause cancer and how can we treat that infection and stop the cancer. And so when we think about viruses and cancer, uh, it's important that we think about first what is a normal cell and what is a cancer cell. So a normal cell is a cell that pretty much has a particular lifespan. It, 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 divides for a particular amount of time, and then it dies. It has a lifespan just like us. But when you think about cancer, these cells are out of control. They have alterations that make them go out of control and divide. Some of those alterations include immortality, which pretty much means they live forever. Some of these alterations mean that it can divide and divide out of control and therefore cause these tumor masses. And so the alteration that I was most interested in was the whole altered cellular metabolism alteration. And what that means is that cancer cells, they actually are really sugar greedy. And what that means is that they take in a lot more sugar than your other cells. And not only that, they require that extra sugar to make more of themselves. And this phenomenon of altered metabolism was really interesting to me. So I wanted to see, can a virus that causes cancer alter the metabolism of its host? Because if it did, then we can lead to a future in antiviral therapy. Uh, this co whole concept of cancer being greedy in the sense of shaking in sugar is actually illustrated really nicely by a technique known as positron emission tomography or PET scanning. You might have known somebody who's gone in for a PET scan to, to image their cancer tumors. And this is the same phenomenon that is causing it. Pretty much what happens is because cancer cells are sugar greedy, they will take in higher levels of sugar than normal cells. And so pretty much cancer patients go in, they go to the doctor's office, they take a sugar that is pretty much labeled as a tracer. And that sugar, when they take it in, the cells that take in more sugar will take in the tracer or the label, and cells that take in normal rates will not. And you can image that. And according to this picture, what you can see to your left is that you have a cancer patient pre-therapy, and you can see that there's tracer pretty much accumulating in the liver. And in the same aspect, the kidneys are naturally sugar greedy. They take in higher levels of sugar, so the tracer will accumulate there as well, but that's normal. And as you look at post-cancer therapy, what you'll notice is that the tumor is gone, and so is the imaging of that liver cell with those tumors. And again, the kidneys still have that as expected because that's a normal process that they, that they have. And so taking that big picture into account, right, cancer cells take in higher levels of sugar. They require those high levels of sugar to survive. It provides energy for them. It gives them fats to produce and proteins to make and genetic information because all these metabolism pathways all combine in that aspect. And so as we think about this and going back to me and viruses, I thought, well, if a virus is causing cancer, likely it's going to do these alterations, including changing metabolism. And so I had the question, can a virus which causes cancer, when infecting a cell, change that host and make it take in more sugar. And so I pretty much, uh, in, our, in our lab, we performed an experiment. And that experiment was taking a normal cell, feeding it sugar, taking a virus-infected cell with the virus Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, feeding that a sugar that's labeled, and then measuring, just like a PET scan, how much does this virus, or does this virus-infected cell versus non-infected cell take in sugar? And here is showing you that data. And what you're looking at is just a simple bar graph. And you'll see non-infected cells take in normal rates of sugar. However, virus-infected cells take in 50% more sugar. Now, if you think about that, if you were taking 50% more sugar in your diet, what kind of implications that would mean for you? And these virus-infected cells are taking advantage of this. They want their host to take in more sugar. Why? Because they can make their host 
pretty much manipulate their host to make more energy, more fats, more proteins, more genetic information to make more of them. They care about them, not about the cells, not about you. They care about them, even though they're not alive, which is why it's so fascinating. And so thinking about this whole entire process, you know, it's, you have to, you know, cellular metabolism, you know, is, is so complex. And I think it's easiest to think of cellular metabolism as a roadmap, right? You have, you know, some paths and roads that you can take. There might be forks in the road. You might just say, decide I'm going to take road one versus road two. Well, our cells behave in that way too. And they think of cell metabolism and they decide which roads to take. And so normal cells will take road one and then they come to a fork in the road. And they say, how do I want to continue extracting energy from sugar? Do I take road A or B? Well, normal cells will always take road A. That's just the default programming. Really occasionally, you know, when you're out of breath, probably after vigorous exercise, you might take road B for just a couple seconds. But then as soon as you regain your oxygen, you go back to road A. Cancer cells are very unique. Not only do they take road, a, uh, road 1 in order to break down their sugar, but they also increase the speed of road 1, as well as take road B, not A, as their primary way of extracting energy. So this leads to the question, can we utilize this you know, change in, in direction which road we choose, you know, or which road the cancer cells choose to make drug therapies? Well, the truth is, yes, we can. This phenomenon was actually discovered back in 1924 by a scientist called Otto Warburg. And of course, because scientists like to name things after themselves, he called this the Warburg effect. And what was seen is pretty much almost all tumors ever discovered show this type of change where they shift from taking road A instead to take road B. And you can use drugs. And there are drugs out in the clinical trials right now. And there are drugs that are already approved for the market that treat cancer because of this change in metabolism by taking road B. And it doesn't seem to do much harm for normal cells because they take road A. And so thinking about this, I know virus infected cells change cell metabolism. So can we use drugs that are used for cancer for viruses? Could that be a possible shift in our future for viral therapy? Can we block road B and lead to new virus therapies? And so I thought, let's try it. Well, I had an experiment. I set it up in the lab. And I said, what would happen if I were to take a virus-infected cell and a non-infected cell and treat it with a drug which blocks road B? Can I kill virus-infected cells and hopefully not kill normal cells, because we don't want that to happen, right? We want to keep normal cells happy and fine, and we want to kill virus-infected cells. And so I did an experiment, and I treated cells with a drug which kills or which blocks road B. And this is the data. So you can see, you know, in this, we're looking at cell death. So these are cells and their death rates uh, and, how, and how often they're dying. And I have shown in blue non-infected cells and in peak, pink, virus-infected cells. And as you can see by this data, at zero treatment, or 100 millimolar treatment of drug called oximate, normal cells, their death rate doesn't change, right? We talked about normal cells die, and so that's a normal percent. 3.2% cell death um, in the lab is pretty common for the cell type I was using. And as you see with zero drug, virus-infected cells die a little bit more than infected cells. That's expected. You, got just, you just got infected by a virus, right? It's killing your cells in a lot of the times in the process. However, what happens when we actually add drug? Normal cells do not die because they take pathway A, not pathway B. Virus-infected cells, they do. And they, this is important, and this is a, a, a new revolution in the way we think because we just killed reservoir virus. We killed not by targeting the virus itself, we killed the way the virus changed the cell's metabolism. And that's, I think, mind-blowing when you think about the future of what this implication can mean, right? But not only that, other studies, other viruses have now been shown to do this. Probably the first time a virus that has really been seriously looked at changing metabolism was back in 2006. I started my studies and published in 2010. Since then, Several other viruses have been shown to alter metabolism. 
And this is just showing you one example of a paper that came out that shows dengue virus, yellow fever virus, West Nile virus. They actually change other metabolic pathways, such as fat metabolism. So can anti-fat metabolism drugs get rid of virus infection? And the answer is yes. You can treat these viruses with low doses of anti-fat metabolism drugs. And you'll see that, as seen here in blue, that pretty much these viruses are keeping their, their cell, the cells that they're infecting at normal levels. They're pretty much not dying. The cells are fine. But when you look at virus infections, which are shown in red, what you'll see is that the actual virus levels goes down in the body. So this is a twofold thing. Not only can we get rid of reservoir virus by adding anti-metabolism inhibitors or anti-metabolism drugs, we can also get rid of virus infections by lowering, lowering the levels in our body. So this is a two-fold system. And ever since then, you know, within the last couple years, what we're seeing is that there are many, many different types of viruses that are starting to cause infections. And these infections are leading to changes in metabolism. These are just showing you some of the diseases that these viruses cause and how they're actually leading to alterations in cell metabolism. And some of these papers have highlighted anti-metabolism drugs as a way to treat these infections. And so as we look at the future, what should we be focusing on? Well, we should definitely be focusing on specifics, on virus drug treatments that are specific towards each virus. That should still be a focus. But maybe we should also focus on these viruses um, specifically, but as well as using metabolism drugs, which we have learned from cancer therapy works, using them to kill viruses or viruses that are, that are hiding in their host and therefore lead to a brand new field of antiviral therapy. Thank you. Thank you.